I do have a rule that I don't tell jokes in sermons. Um, anecdotes are allowed, or, or kind of amusing stories, but jokes are uh, not allowed. But today, I break the habit of a lifetime uh, and ask you to forgive me for this gem. Uh, so Bobby, he's driving around and he's uh, horribly, horribly lost. Uh, and he phones up Sarah and Sarah says to him, well, where are you trying to get to? He says, I'm trying to get to Epping. So she says, well, where are you at the moment? He says, well, I don't really know, but I think I, I, think I saw a sign and I'm somewhere outside Edinburgh. And, and so she, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pause at the other end of the line. And then she comes back to him and she says, well, if I were trying to get to Epping, I wouldn't be starting from there. That's why I don't tell jokes. <laughs> but the, the reason I, I did today, it, it, it's, its appropriateness, I think, is, is in how uh, we engage with our quest for understanding and learning about uh, the nature of God, uh, and particularly his Trinitarian nature. Consider this. Um, I phone up my friend. And I say, I'm trying to form a concept of the nature of God. And they say, right, um, where are you at the moment? And I say, well, this is what I've got. Uh, God is three in one and one in three. It's not that he's really three, but sometimes kind of morphs together to become super God. Uh, and it's not that he's really one, but just sometimes shows himself as three different things to us. He's three and one, eternally three, eternally one. And then there'd be a pause. <laughs> and then from the other end of the phone, I'd get back. Well, if I was trying to work out a concept of the nature of God, I wouldn't start from there. <laughs> uh, and for that reason, I think it's worth reviewing uh, the genesis of the Trinity, where, where it does come from. Um, and it's a little surprising and, and quite pleasing, I think, probably. Um, we have a group of possibly illiterate fishermen, um, some blue-collar Palestinian workers. Uh, we call them the disciples and the early church. Uh, and they know about this person uh, called God. They are Jews. They're temple and synagogue worshipping Jews. They know about God who created the world. They know about God who is worshipped in the temple, whom uh, the priests make sacrifices to, in order that their sins may be washed clean and that they might appropriately approach God. They know about God who uh, showed himself to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. They know about God who appeared to Moses in the bush, who at the top of the mountain gave to Moses the law. They know about God. And then this astonishing thing happens to them. Uh, they meet this man that they can see this man that they can touch, you know, they can uh, feel the, the roughness of his hands, they can smell his sweat when it's hot. And he does miraculous deeds. He proclaims the word of God to them. He reveals the Father to them. He prays to the Father, but he also claims for himself divinity. He tells them that he will die and rise again, and then he goes and does just that. And when he returns risen, in a body they can still see and touch and smell and feel, they acknowledge him as God. Certainly not the father, not the God of Israel, not the God who was the God of a single nation, who appeared only to select leaders. This is a God in flesh and blood. The same, the one same God, but clearly not the father. And then when Christ ascends... As he promised to them, they meet together in Jerusalem and they're filled with the Holy Spirit who comes with miraculous signs, who dwells within them. God, again, certainly, yes, the same Spirit through whom Christ, when he was walking the earth, carried out his miraculous deeds. But not the Father and certainly not the Son. They knew a few things, the early church. They knew that God was one. They knew that the Father was God. They knew that the Son was God. They knew that the Holy Spirit was God. And they knew that the Father was not the Son. The Son was not the Spirit. The Spirit was not the Father. 
Just like the driver in our joke couldn't choose from where he started, uh, neither can we as Christians choose from where we begin our search and our delve into knowledge about the nature of God. We start from there, from the experiences, the raw and unedited experiences of those first disciples. That doesn't mean that it's uh, simple, it's not a, a, a simple topic, and I wouldn't pretend to, to, to say that it was. Um, it is inherently difficult precisely because the disciples and those who were uh, writing for the early church and whose records we read now didn't cleverly and clearly process the whole thing out first. They didn't go about it in a way where they thought, uh, this will make it easier for, for those following us in the future. They just recorded their experience, the God who had been revealed to them, and left the working out of it up to us. It is difficult, and for that reason, the Trinity has become, in many ways, a kind of matter exclusively for those hidden away in uh, the towers of the universities. And those of you who've ever uh, considered reading a book on, on the Trinity uh, would have found that when you go to, to the library or to the, um, the bookshop, um, the volumes begin about this thick and work up from there. And those of you who weren't put off by that and actually open them uh, will find a lot of kind of in-depth discussion about uh, a number of archaic Latin and Greek terms which may or may not aid us in our understanding. It is hard, but I urge you to remember that it's not an invention of the university. It's not the invention of some uh, academic with too much time on their hands. This is just the lived, unedited, raw experience of the disciples and the early church. And there's another reason, uh, apart from its inherent difficulty, that I think it's hard for us today, and that's because our experience of God isn't so uh, neatly delineated as was the early churches. Not many of us have come uh, from our worshipping Jewish backgrounds to suddenly meet with the man Christ to shake his hand and then having seen him risen and ascended, being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just not the model through which uh, we engage with God today. The God that was for them neatly delineated because of their experience is only for us delineated because of the way in which we imagine, because of the sources that we read. That makes it hard for us too. But does it make it hard enough to stop bothering with? Um, we're blessed in the Anglican Church that the Trinity forms uh, many of the, the pieces, the heart of the pieces of our worship. Um, at the beginning of our services, we meet in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we uh, sing or say our psalms, we conclude, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Uh, our liturgy uh, keeps us on track, even when our temptation would be uh, to, to not bother with it. Uh, but I suggest to you that it is important that we stick with the Trinity, uh, and I offer some reasons here. Uh, firstly, it's the way that God chooses to reveal himself. And God is not a deceiver. Uh, as outrageous as it might be, uh, the Trinity is the way that God chooses to reveal himself to us. And he doesn't do it just to trick us or befuddle us or mystify us. And it's the experience of the early Christians, and it's been defended by our ancestors in the faith again and again and again. And when I say defended, uh, it really has. For the first five or six centuries of, of the church's life, there were more or less pitched battles uh, about the nature of the Trinity. Uh, and all of the, the heretics and the, and the schismatic movements, or 90% of them at least, in those first years, were arguments over the nature of the Godhead. I suggest that we don't give up on it because... I think that the more that we engage with and understand the nature and the relationship of God in and of himself, then the more that we understand the nature and the relationship of us, his created beings. Um, just as one example, uh, consider the nature, how we understand personhood, what it is to be a person today. Uh, we are products of 
uh, Western Enlightenment thinking. Uh, and that means that persons for us are, are individuals. Um, James Torrance offers this uh, sort of scathing rendition of uh, the American Declaration of Independence. He says that we have this preoccupation with the self. My rights, my life, my liberty, my pursuit of happiness. Might an understanding of the Trinity not be better, he says. An understanding of the Trinity who delivers us from a narcissistic preoccupation with the self to find our true being in loving communion with God and one another. We're not who we are as individuals despite the relationships that we have. We are who we are as individuals precisely because of the relationships that we have. To hear God's call to us in our day to participate through the Spirit in Christ's communion with the Father and his mission from the Father to the world. To create in our day a new humanity of persons who find true fulfilment not in my, 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 but in other-centred communion. We should stick with the Trinity because the more we engage in understanding the nature and the relationship of God, the more we understand about our nature and our relationships. And finally, I think that the Trinity explains what on earth we're all doing here uh, at this early hour on a Sunday morning. If we believed in a, a, a Unitarian God, a just us and a God, we'd have to think that our worship somehow had to be uh, great enough and good enough to in and of itself be pleasing to God. That our shaky voices, my ropey preaching, our wandering prayers were somehow uh, sufficient to bring us into God's presence. But there is only one offering, one sacrifice of worship, which is acceptable and sufficient for all time. The offering of his son, Jesus Christ. Our sin, which separates us from God, is absolved in the death and resurrection of Christ. We are sanctified, we're made pure and holy, acceptable to be in God's presence. We're made dwelling places for his Holy Spirit. And we, by this, are privileged to join in that one true and acceptable offering to the Father made by Jesus Christ. That's what we do here on a Sunday morning. Not try and impress God by the worship that we can muster up, but take part in the true worship given by the Son. We don't rely on our own strength, but we participate in that mutual love and glorification indwelt in the Trinity. The Trinity is hard, but it is the foundation of our faith. It's the experience of our ancestors. It tells us about the nature of God and the nature of ourselves. And it's the assurance of the worth of our worship. Don't give up on it. Amen.